Volume Three, Chapter Two, Part One of The Mummy, A Tale of the Twenty Second Century. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Mummy, A Tale of the Twenty Second Century, by Jane Loudon, Volume Three, Chapter Two, Part One. Whilst these scenes were taking place in Spain, Elvira was beginning to discover in England that it was not quite so delightful to be a queen as she had previously imagined. The contending parties in the state had been roused into action by the late struggle, and party spirit is of all others the most difficult to conquer. Besides this, the choice of Elvira having been rather a matter of feeling than of judgment, men felt dissatisfied at having suffered themselves to be hurried away by their passions and as is usual in such cases they were disposed to vent the ill-humour they felt at their own conduct upon everything which chanced to fall in their way thus even the best measures of elvira's government were warmly criticised and thus she unfortunately altered some of her laws in consequence of these objections the critics were encouraged to proceed and fancying her compliance to be the result of weakness, when it was, in fact, only produced by her natural candor and love of justice, the people became more outrageous and troublesome with every concession that was made to them. Elvira's intentions were excellent, but by unfortunately wishing to please everyone, she destroyed their effect. This made her counsels vacillating and her measures uncertain nothing indeed but the strength of mind and commanding genius of edmund joined to his complete devotion to her cause could have prevented the ruin of her government almost in the moment of its formation from a mistaken motive of generosity she had retained in her council those lords who had most vehemently opposed her though in compliance with the wishes of edmund they were shorn of their beams this was a fatal error half measures are always dangerous the lords in question should have been discarded altogether, or retained in their former seats. As it was, Elvira had made them enemies, and yet left them the power to sting her. The emissaries of Rosabella were also very active, and the ferment of the public mind excessive. The taste the people had just enjoyed of power had only been enough to make them long for more. They had only just begun to relish its sweets, when the dish was snatched away from them, though if it had been left them to devour they would have soon been cloyed and disgusted by its taste discontents became general disturbances arose which were no sooner quelled in one quarter than they broke out in another and these petty insurrections though almost too trivial to mention were excessively annoying for trifling inconveniences like a host of flies buzzing round a nervous man on a sultry day are often more irritating to the temper than serious grievances and the noble mind of edmund was wearied in subduing such paltry enemies they want employment said he one day to the queen after reading a dispatch containing an account of one of the most vexatious of these tumults you must build bridges and cut canals to amuse them the active mind of elvira caught eagerly at the idea and she vainly fancied her name would be handed down to posterity as one of the greatest of queens who though in the bloom of youth and pride of beauty did not hesitate to sacrifice herself for the good of her people and to devote that time to their welfare and the improvement of her kingdom which others of her age and rank wasted in mere amusements delighted with the thought elvira did not delay a moment before she prepared to put it in practice and she was found for several days together constantly surrounded by her counsellors and seated at a table absolutely loaded with papers which she was busily employed in inspecting and arranging plans for the erection of public buildings for hospitals bridges museums and churches schemes for new manufactories hints for establishments conducive to the public good and sketches of discoveries which were to produce wonders lay in heaps before her mixed with addresses of compliments votes of thanks complaints of grievances petitions secret informations and in short all that multifarious collection of paper with which a monarch is sure to be surrounded who is said to be anxious to ameliorate the condition of his people or who is unhappily reported to possess a genius for improvement 
unfortunate is the man possessed of power of whom such reports are current he is directly surrounded by projectors each presenting a scheme more futile than that of his predecessor and discontented dependents each bringing a long list of grievances half of which are imaginary but which have been conjured up by the complainants that they may not lose the precious right they enjoy of complaining unhappy he whose fate obliges him to decide between the rival claimants certain alike to be blamed if he give or refuse if he accept or if he reject elvira had not yet found the evils of power but she now tasted of its sweets and was enchanted it seemed to her the most delightful thing in the world to hold in her hands the destinies of thousands of her fellow-creatures and she thought not of the heavy responsibility it entailed nor how often her path would be followed by curses instead of blessings some one has said that every time a sovereign confers a favour he makes one ungrateful subject and nine discontented ones but elvira and edmund as yet had not discovered the truth of this maxim since their present plan had been suggested everything with them had been the couleur de rose i say them for edmund was associated with elvira in all these gigantic schemes of improvement for as he had conceived the first idea of them so it was he only who could carry them into execution his active mind required something to employ it and the same strong feelings which had formerly been devoted to love and glory were now turned into another channel the energies of elvira's mind had also been awakened by the struggle for the crown and the passion inspired in her breast by the youthful stranger and she now felt that she could not quietly return again to the commonplace stillness of everyday life the passions when once aroused from their dormant state must have something to occupy them or they will prey upon themselves thus we generally see great warriors or statesmen or in fact any class of men who have passed their lives in activity wither away when forced to the dullness of an obscure retirement their minds and bodies decay alike from want of stimulants to call them into action the improvement of her people supplied the stimulus to the mind of elvira but alas she entered upon it rather with passion than judgment and had not patience to wait to see her plans gradually carried into effect no no she could not endure anything slow with her everything must be done by a coup de main and as the people and the buildings were so stupid as not to be made perfect by the first attempt she was continually disappointed and discouraged in fact by attempting to do too much she did nothing when elvira ascended the throne she determined no public act should take place without the approbation of her council and these noble lords were one day debating upon the propriety of a new road that was proposed to intersect the entire kingdom at right angles when lord gustavus de montfort rose to oppose it upon the ground of the injury it would do to private property if carried into effect elvira could not endure lord gustavus his cold prudent calculating manner without a single spark of imagination disgusted her beyond description and the only good quality he possessed that of being indefatigable in following up his point completed her abhorrence wit and eloquence were quite thrown away upon him for he understood neither the one nor the other and when any new or brilliant scheme crossed Elvira's imagination, and she described it to her council, with all the fire of genius and animation, there he sat with his calm, cold, unvarying countenance, ready to dump it with a doubt. Lord Maysworth also was her aversion. His narrow mind, which could only take in such trifles as escaped the observation of men of genius, his mean and paltry spirit, and his grovelling ambition were all her detestation whilst lord noodle and lord doodle who though ciphers in themselves yet like their prototypes prodigiously increased the weight of the figures placed before them completed the group much however as elvira disliked these members of her council she felt unequal to resist their combined influence and she was just upon the point of being teased into their opinions contrary to her own judgment when lord edmund entered the room indescribable was the effect produced by his presence for indeed his commanding talents swayed all before them and elvira could not help smiling when she saw her counsellors of state shake their wise heads and imagine they were assisting the debate with their wisdom whilst in fact they were mere tools in his powerful hands 
it is true they were the agents that produced the intended effect but his was the master spirit which set them in motion and taught them where to go his powerful intellect caught in an instant the comparative merits and disadvantages of the plan now in discussion and his nod decided its fate whilst the council though they implicitly obeyed his will had not the least idea that they were doing so as he had the address so to form his opinions as to let each person imagine them the suggestion of his own breast while the principal personages in the cabinet fancying they were leading were thus blindly led the non-entities of course followed in their train and our old friends the lords of ancient family were perfectly astonished when they heard the magnificent plants and sagacious counsels attributed to them and sat quite lost in admiration of their own wisdom whilst their little heads and enormous periwigs kept bobbing with at least threefold their accustomed rapidity elvira's accession to the throne had induced both her father and sir ambrose to leave the country the duke inhabiting his former palace and sir ambrose taking possession of a movable house in its immediate neighbourhood where the worthy baronet found himself perfectly happy in the society of his old friend and his pretty niece i begin to repent that my daughter is a queen said the duke to sir ambrose one night after supper when the whole party were sitting cosily round the fire in sir ambrose's library i have not half the enjoyments i used to have when i could have more of her society now when i see her it is but for an instant and she can scarcely stay to ask me how i do before she flies off to some of her new plans of improvement the face of the country will be quite changed in a few years if all the plans of the queen prosper said father morris in his usual smooth hypocritical manner i hope not cried sir ambrose i hope it's no treason duke but i must confess i wish your daughter had never been queen if she can't leave things as they are i am pretty much of your opinion they are such wild goose schemes that she takes into her head said the duke piteously only imagine sir ambrose she showed me this morning a plan for making aerial bridges to convey heavy weights from one steeple to another a machine for stamping shoes and boots at one blow out of a solid piece of leather a steam engine for milking cows and an elastic summer house that might be folded up so as to be put into a man's pocket it is really provoking and edmund is quite a scheming and visionary i absolutely think if we were both to die they would not feel more than a temporary uneasiness at our loss their minds are so completely occupied in these gigantic projects i fear so indeed all things were otherwise formerly i remember the time and so on but why detail the reminiscence it may be easily imagined how comfortably two old men would amuse themselves over a good fire commenting on the glorious days when they were young when all went right or what was nearly the same thing when all appeared to them to do so quite forgetting that age has other eyes than youth and that the change was in themselves not the times we have other things to attend to clara was at a splendid party given by elvira and father morris soon left the duke's library to join her it was a ball and the splendid court of claudia seemed yet more brilliant under the reign of a successor it was the first time clara had ever been at court and the effect the gorgeous magnificence of the scene had upon her was powerful in the extreme she forgot her cares her sadness and her love all seemed enchantment and the old lady who acted as her chaperone was quite horrorized at her cocherie brilliant as all was however the lovely goddess of the temple far exceeded even the splendour of the shrine and the beholders gazed upon her with indescribable rapture beautiful as the fairy image of a dream kind affable and condescending elvira glided through the crowd followed by her suit to the concert-room here all that imagination of man could devise of harmony enchanted the ears but harsh was every other sound to that which stole upon the senses when elvira was induced to forget her rank and mingle her voice with the music elvira's singing was perfection clear as a trumpet with a silver sound the round full notes now swelled upon the ear in liquid melody and then died away soft and sweet yet distinct even in their faintest strains prince ferdinand was at her side and his ardent gaze bespoke the intenseness of his admiration 
elvira had not before seen him since the night when her conversation with him had so powerfully excited the jealousy of edmund and as she now observed his manner had again attracted edmund's attention she blushed yet more deeply than before edmund saw her blushes and stung almost to madness by the sight rushed violently out of the room the night was cold and damp a drizzling mist fell fast and that peculiar chill which marks the first approaches of winter hung in the air but lord edmund thought not of the weather and he strode bareheaded through the palace gardens with hurried steps and the actions of a maniac whilst the thick gloom which pervaded the sky contrasted fearfully with the brilliantly illuminated apartment he had just quitted the gloominess of the scene however harmonized well with edmund's feelings he felt soothed insensibly and though he still walked moodily backwards and forwards he became gradually more calm ungrateful woman thought he to treat me thus does she not owe everything to me i could bear her coldness i could resign her to a throne but the idea of her loving another drives me to destruction curses on that fiend that detested mummy it must be by his infernal arts that ferdinand has triumphed for elvira evidently loves him her blushes tell her passion and elvira the cold the chaste elvira could never give her love thus thus almost unsolicited and at first sight if it were not the work of magic the fiend threatened to be revenged when i refused his proffered aid and spurned him from me his impious arts have prospered and i am wretched yet still i do not repent and still if he knelt before me i would trample him beneath my feet by heaven i would risk my soul for vengeance on that demon as he spoke his eyes fell upon a thicket near him and he fancied he saw the figure of a man half obscured by the mist emerge from its gloomy recesses he gazed intently and the figure glided slowly on with cat-like creeping steps the mind of edmund was worked up to frenzy he almost fancied a demon had appeared obedient to his wish to receive his pledge and work his bidding speak cried he in a voice that sounded fearfully amidst the surrounding stillness speak art thou a demon or a mortal all was silent the figure glided on and lord edmund oppressed by supernatural terrors and shuddering at the sound of his own voice could bear no more he darted upon the figure and grasping it roughly he exclaimed man or devil i fear thee not and thus will i grapple with thee gently my son replied the well-known voice of father morris in what have i offended you pardon holy father returned edmund i knew you not i knew not what i did my passion blinded me and what has caused this passion the mind of edmund is too noble to be lightly moved oh talk not of the nobleness of my mind father i feel i am but a poor weak worm nobleness belongs to god alone it is blasphemy to apply the term to man tell me your grievances they must i am sure be great or they would not thus affect you it is my holy office to console affliction speak then my son for remember that though joy is doubled by being partaken grief is lessened by being shared and woe robbed of half its bitterness i have little to confess father i was weak and foolish but elvira and are you astonished at a woman's fickleness light as the eider down and unstable as the changing wind inconstancy is natural to the sex they crave incessantly for novelty and as vanity is their only real passion if that be gratified they ask no more and has not elvira's vanity been gratified even to satiety have i not idolized worshipped her was it not my power that made her what she is and is this my reward to be scorned deserted laughed at and for what a stranger a boy my prisoner whom do you mean asked the friar prince ferdinand returned edmund impossible cried father morris starting with well-feigned astonishment elvira cannot surely love prince ferdinand 
and yet now i recollect i saw her talking to him even now with an appearance of deep interest when i passed through her splendid chambers damnation exclaimed lord edmund vehemently driven to destruction by this speech for strange to tell though we may be certain of the reality of our own sufferings they always seem to come with double poignancy when we hear them related by another calm yourself my son said father morris in his silky tones eyeing him with about as much compassion as an angler feels for the writhing of a worm upon his hook these bursts of passion are unworthy of you oh father cried edmund softened almost into tears you know not how i loved that woman your grave serious feelings disciplined by the restraints of a cloister mortified by your renunciation of all earthly pleasures can form no idea of the depth and fierceness of mine your passions father are dead within you subdued by holy penitence to calmness but mine rage with the fury of a volcano and destroy me oh that my fond attachment my long devoted services my adoration should be thus rewarded yes my adoration for i have adored her father i worshipped her like a goddess and though i doted on her charms and would have endured unheard of torments to have been blessed with their possession yet did i not sacrifice my hopes did i not relinquish the treasure when just within my grasp because her happiness was dearer to me than my own and now to see her lavish her favours on that boy she smiled upon him father and he dared to take her hand and press it to his lips i saw him kiss it not with the calm respect of a kneeling subject but with the fervour the impassionate ardour of a lover and then he looked at her curses on the thought and she did not reprove but casting down her eyes softly blushed consent damnation i cannot endure it passion my son entails its own punishment you see everything with a jaundiced eye elvira's nature is gentle and yielding she feared to hurt his feelings by her harshness tis but the natural consequence of that very softness you so often have admired why should you quarrel with it now tis still the same that charmed you save that it is now extended to another and will be soon no doubt to all the world elvira has been educated in retirement and seeing only yourself and edric you thought her conduct was the effect of partiality for you when in fact it was but her natural manner she is now upon a larger theatre and you must expect to see myriads of kneeling victims worship her beauty and pay homage at her feet and do you suppose she will be displeased at their attention no she is far too gentle she has no firmness and the same submission she now pays to you she will if you offend her easily transfer to another she is not formed to govern she would obey and be happy but the weight of government would overwhelm her if she were left alone to sustain it shake off then these selfish feelings and be again yourself you have often said you only wish her happiness and if that be the case even if she should really love prince ferdinand you ought to rejoice to see her in his arms sooner would i perish sooner would i involve all in one universal ruin but it is impossible she scarcely knows him and if it were so still you would be wrong to blame elvira for what in fact she cannot help her yielding softness is the defect of her character fool that i was that very softness caught me and my fond heart fell captive to its chains but it was folly infatuation i see my error rosabella has more character she can love lord edmund crossed his arms upon his breast and was soon lost in a reverie which father morris was careful not to interrupt but which was broken by the approach of Travers, his lordship's aide-de-camp and secretary. "'What do you want?' asked Lord Edmund sternly. "'I came to seek your lordship. I feared you were unwell, as I missed your lordship from the party.' "'You missed me,' repeated Lord Edmund bitterly. "'You missed me.' "'And did no one else discover my absence? 
was it so marked that my servant could observe it and yet no one else did not the queen inquire for lord edmund asked father morris i did not hear her majesty replied trevers how was she engaged what was she doing demanded lord edmund she was sitting talking to prince ferdinand my lord lord edmund gnashed his teeth together grinding them with fury and rushed back to the house without speaking whilst trevers followed at a humble distance he has it cried father morris triumphantly he has it and he is mine for ever End of chapter two part one of volume three